Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Charlotte Brewer Redney. As Israel's war on Gaza enters its 11th month, the enclave is experiencing an ever worsening humanitarian catastrophe. While civilians are facing hunger, disease, and repeated displacement, calls for an immediate ceasefire continue to fall on deaf ears. In the latest effort to put pressure on Tel Aviv, Turkey has submitted a formal bid to join South Africa's genocide case against Israel, once again at the UN's highest court. The Turkish delegation handed in documents to join the case at the International Court of Justice in The Hague on Wednesday. Turkey's Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan made the announcement during his two-day trip to Egypt. On his first day there, Fidan visited the Rafah border crossing with the Gaza Strip, where he said blocking aid efforts was Israel's first step towards committing genocide against Palestinians. Since October 7th, Tel Aviv has killed nearly 40,000 civilians in the enclave. So far, Israel has failed to implement orders by the ICJ, which has said that Palestinians are at real risk of irreparable damage from the war being waged in Gaza. Well, Israel denies any wrongdoing and has also denounced the case that was first filed by South Africa in December and then followed by several other countries. Well, let's start with Turkey's decision to join the genocide case against Israel. Anisha Patel, a governing council member at Law for Palestine, joins me now from Berlin. And Bader Al-Madi, a professor of political sociology at the German Jordanian University, joins me from Amman. Well, Turkey has, as we've been hearing, submitted that application to join the ICJ case. Bader Al-Madi, if I start with you, how will that add to the international pressure on the Israeli government to end the war or change the way it's beh behaving in Gaza? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me. I think this is one of the uh, unimportant steps uh, towards actually uh, convincing Israel with what they are doing against the Palestinian people in Gaza. Uh, I think Turkey it is uh, one of the most important regional power as well as uh, Turkey has a lot of influence uh, over uh, actually uh, the world and uh, uh, arena uh, actually around the world in terms of the legal and political issues. Uh, when Turkey actually asked for uh, joining uh, the case itself, I think it will give a huge push as uh, a Muslim country and as well-known country of uh, defending the rights actually of other people who've been exposed to such problematic issues and criminal acts, as well as Turkey always uh, been the most important country who uh, were able to document actually the Israeli uh, uh, act against the Palestinian people in Gaza and even for that uh, in the Palestinian territory, whether the West Bank or even uh, actually uh, Jerusalem. Uh, also, when we talk about uh, Turkey, it is so important uh, uh, to have uh, Turkey as a state because of the experience that also Turkey has and it could be used uh, to make evaluation of the document has been uh, presented to the court itself and this is it will give a, a huge uh, support for South Africa and other countries who applied to join the case itself. Then overall I think uh, the, the, the request itself it will be so important uh, for uh, the Palestinian people, for uh, South Africa, and for the international community who believe uh, with the uh, justice and actually to convince, to convince Israel its criminal acts that they are uh, committing every day in Gaza. Anisha, I saw you nodding there. Uh, why do you think it's important for Turkey to join this case? And um, Bader was mentioning experience there. What kind of experiences and input can it bring to bear on the case? Uh, absolutely. I was nodding because I fully agree uh, with my colleague who mentioned all the advantages of Turkey joining this case. And legally speaking, for Turkey, for the application that they have actually made, uh, they make some really, really important inputs on genocidal intent, where they are actually go uh, and outline all the things that are um, that are pointing to genocidal intent, which I think is something critical that will come up in the merit stage of the case. The other thing uh, that the application of Turkey does, which for me, I think, legally speaking, is one of the most important elements, is that it asks the court to link the connection between apartheid and genocide. As you know, the, uh, the International Court of Justice, in its advisory opinion of 19th of July, outlined some very, very important elements, which included um, their conclusion 
concerned that the presence of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory is unlawful and they asked for bringing it to an end as rapidly as possible. The other thing that the court did was outline that Israel was actually in violation of Article 3 of the Convention on Eliminating All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which includes racial segregation and apartheid. So in its application, Turkey actually asks the court to look at apartheid and genocide as two parts of the same process. And I think this input um, that Turkey has brought to this case will be so critical in kind of placing the Palestinian experience, um, not just of what we're seeing in Gaza right now, but in the larger 76-year-old settler colonial um, experience. And about six more countries, Colombia, Nicaragua, Spain, Libya, Palestine and Mexico have also joined the case. Just briefly for me, how significant is it having this larger number of supporters and what will it mean? Yeah, I, I think this is very important and there's nothing new. We do have a lot of cases before and we do have actually a case right now between Ukraine and Russia. And then we do have uh, between uh, actually Nicaragua uh, and Namibia. Uh, where uh, I think uh, this number of the state that they will uh, join, or at least they ask, uh, it is very important uh, to support the file from South Africa, and it will support the right of the Palestinian people. This is, has a lot of significant symbols. When you talk about Spain as a European country, this is very, very important. And it will send a positive message actually for the international court and for the Palestinian people. And it will send an important message also for the Israelis themselves. When you talk about Latin America, when you talk about Libya, for example, when we talk about Turkey, absolutely, this is a different case. When you talk about Turkey, absolutely, Turkey, it is very important as part from the region here. And uh, Turkey consider one of the most important supporter and supportive force for the Palestinian people for a long time. And this is when we talk about this group of states, absolutely, it will add a lot to the uh, case itself. And then it will give credibility for the file that uh, uh, South Africa decided to take it as a step. Turkey, uh, actually, or Turkey was one of the states they wanted to start to initiate the process. But they knew at that time that if South Africa will take such a step, it will be better than been taking from countries like Turkey or Jordan or the Palestinian uh, themselves, Palestinian authorities, where uh, absolutely uh, a lot of countries, they will join later to ask uh, to join later to the court itself or to the file to discuss, to evaluate, to actually present some okay. legal opinion okay. and political opinion to the file itself. And Ankara says it's committed to resolving the Palestinian issue, and I quote, within the framework of law and justice. Anisha, what legal tools does the international community have to prevent Israel from committing war crimes and to hold it accountable? Um, yes, I think this is a really, really important question um, and issue that Turkey is touching upon because at this point, um, resolving uh, the situation in Palestine is actually important for the credibility of the international legal order as we know it. Um, in terms of the tools that we have, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, uh, the International Criminal Court are, of course, uh, important um, means for achieving uh, the sense of justice internationally. But we also have the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. And we know what the problem with the Security Council is, but the UN General Assembly has in the past actually brought forward resolutions that have had great impact on the situations in apartheid South Africa, in Namibia, in territories occupied by Portugal. So we should not forget that we actually have the UN system still to a whale. Um, and last but not the least, by any means, um, there are national jurisdictions. So there are possibilities of bringing cases forward in the national jurisdictions of different countries against the countries themselves, as we have seen in Germany, for supplying arms and being complicit, but also uh, through the universal jurisdiction mechanism, where nationals that have uh, participated in the ongoing hostilities um, that are being committed by Israel can actually be held to account. So there are multiple avenues to um, kind of attain legal justice uh, for all the actions that have been happening now, but also over the last decades. And it's upon us as uh, the rest of the world and third states such as Turkey to actually take these mechanisms forward. Really, really important stuff. Now, 
Badr, you mentioned a range of countries that are supporting this case. Have countries who are seeking justice for Gaza, have they faced pressure or implications from any of Israel's allies at all? Yeah, absolutely. I can't deny this fact. Uh, actually, United States of America is working uh, really hard uh, to prevent a lot of countries from joining, actually, the case, the fight itself. And absolutely, we don't we don't have to be surprised that if United States of America try to make any pressure against Turkey or Libya or even Spain or other countries who ask to join uh, the uh, the fight itself or join actually the case. So uh, United States of America, the EU, especially when we talk about Germany or uh, other important uh, uh, EU countries, absolutely they don't want to see uh, Israel uh, to be convicted actually and to be. Uh, under this pressure from the legal and the big body of uh, legal institutions like the UN. But uh, so just to remember that when we talk about 1948 agreement, which is against uh, committing genocide, the country has to be stand actually for their ethical uh, principles where most of those international countries, sadly, they failed actually to stand for ethical stand and for ethical standards and actually for their history of rhetoric talking always about the, the justice for the people and the freedom for the people and to prevent genocide from happening against the people. Yes, I agree with you. A lot of countries like United States of America and some of European countries, they will actually pressure those countries who ask to join uh, against Israel in this case. Thank you. And Anita, I want to turn to something else now. Last month, the ICJ issued an advisory opinion calling Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories illegal. Where does that leave us in terms of Palestine gaining a UN membership? Does that bring us any further forward or not? Um, I think it will have an impact on how this uh, membership process is evaluated because now at this point, the court has in a sense said that Israel's presence in the occupied territories is unlawful and that means it's conducting aggression. And um, the idea that the Palestinians have been facing this since 1967, but also uh, before that, since, since Resolution 181, means that uh, the courts have said there needs to be reparations for this. There needs to be non-recognition of uh, Israeli presence in the occupied Palestinian territory. When you talk about non-recognition of Israel and its activities in the occupied Palestinian territory, you automatically open up the conversation for the recognition of the Palestinian people and their statehood. And um, this idea that Palestine is not a state is, um, is already legally disputed because of the occupation itself, because Internally, it already has and operates like a state, and the occupation hinders this process. So when the court says that this occupation is unlawful and it should not hinder this process anymore, we uh, we have a conversation for statehood going forward. And uh, just a last question to you, Bader. Israel has, of course, denied the genocide charges and indeed said that it's doing everything it can to protect civilian populations both in Israel and in the Palestinian territories. But as we enter the 11th month of the war, is this narrative of self-defense and having a moral army, is that losing credibility? Absolutely, they are losing credibility. Absolutely, no one can deny the fact that the Israelis are committing a crime and committing a genocide in Gaza. But you know that Israel is using whatever they can use actually in the world when you talk about the social media, media, and absolutely they have a lot of support actually back in United States of America and some of European actually media, where Israel try also to justify and also justify everything and their action, which is absolutely, this is not acceptable here. But sadly, when we talk about United States of America, when we talk about Security Council, and then they can do nothing when they use the veto actually against any international order. Right now, it seems that just Israel and United States of America who are mastering the world and actually they are giving uh, the door widely for any other countries that wanted to commit a crime against their people or against any other people. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time and insight. Anisha Patel from Law for Palestine and Badr Al-Madi from the German Jordanian University. Thanks for being on Straight Talk.